All right, well, welcome to Grassy Valley Baptist Church. Glad you're here. And all those that will be watching us live, we're glad that you're with us as well. We're finishing up Hosea. And uh, we've been talking about an unfailing love to an unfaithful people. And tonight I'm excited. I'm excited about being able to finish up this book. It's been an an exciting book for me. As I've told you before, um, I've studied this book before, but usually I get through the first three chapters and then I'm done because when you get to the fourth and fifth chapters and sixth all the way down, it's just nothing but prophecy and prophecy and prophecy. And some of it's repetitive, but man, I've really, really enjoyed uh, going deeper into this book, uh, studying the chapters themselves. How many of you like to be late for things? No, nobody likes to be late? How many of you are late? You're just constantly, you, I see one hand back this way. Just you, you never can help it, you're always late. Has anybody ever been that way? Okay. I, I hate to be late. Well, no, no, I, 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 you are, I'm just, did, have you ever, when you dated somebody, guys, did, you, did your girlfriend, was she always late when she said you'd be ready by 6 o'clock? Was she always late? No? Okay. All right. Okay. Bill? I think one of the things that scares me, uh, and I've, I've got a, there's some phobias in life. One of those things that I'm afraid of is when I'm, when I'm traveling, I've always been afraid of missing the flight. It scares me to death. I go to, I'm always the one saying, okay, we got to be at the airport by, you know, two or three hours before we have to leave. I want to make sure we're through the security. I want to make sure I'm sitting in my seat at least an hour, hour and a half before they even start calling, you know. And um, my wife and I will be sitting there waiting for the flights. I've been there with her on so many times. We'll be sitting there waiting for the flights. And then as soon as they start going, oh, flight, flight, you know, so-and-so number, going to Knoxville or going wherever we're going, she stands up and she goes, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm like, why? Why are you doing this now? I mean, we, we could, we, we gotta, we're going to be boarding here real soon, and you're wanting to go to the bathroom. Oh, we got time. We got time. No, we don't have time. You know, um, you, we need to get on the plane. They're going to be, they're calling section one now. We're section five. You, we're, they're going to be calling us any minute, you know. We're always on the tail, you know. There's no, I'm always getting the cheap sheet, seats, you know. But she's, uh, she's always like, okay, it's time for me to go to the bathroom. Well, she always has to mosey on down, go to the bathroom. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. We're going to, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. But you hear them. You, you, they'll, they'll start, once they start making the call to board the plane, I, get, I start getting nervous. I don't want to miss the flight. And they always say, everyone else can board now. They get to that point, and I'm like, okay, I'm the last one. So I'm standing up, standing in line, and I'm looking back. Jennifer, are you coming? Oh, I don't want to go to Knoxville without her. You know, I don't want to go to Florida without her. I can't, I can't board this plane without her. And then finally she shows up. What are you worried about? We're going to make it. We're fine. And then after we, they, they load everybody, they go, this is the last call, the last boarding call for such and such. This is the last boarding call for such and such flight. And I got to thinking about it because I've sat in, in the airports and I've listened to them call for other people, you know, I've called other planes. And after they get through all the boarding passes, they still go, this is the last call. This is the last call. Ten minutes later, this is the final call. And I'm thinking, we did have time. We did have time. We had time to go to the bathroom. We had time to do whatever we got to do. We're going to be shutting the doors in a few minutes. And I think in our passage tonight, Hosea is shouting to the Lord, shouting from the Lord, this is the last call. This is our last appeal. This is the last promise. This is his last word. Okay? And it's exciting because now that we, we've gone through all this hard, hard prophecy, Hosea is saying this is the last of it right here. I want to share with you this is his last call to you, uh, but it's all out of love. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Hosea chapter 14. Turn to Hosea chapter 14. We're going to be looking at the first three verses. And I want, to, I want you to notice the, the very first, um, the very first, what I call the last appeal, okay? This is what I call the last appeal. And it's really a last call to repent, okay? In Hosea chapter 14, starting in verse 1, it says, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to Him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, that we may present the fruit of our lips. 
Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses. Nor will we say again, O God, to the work of our hands, for in you the orphan finds mercy. You know, though his people may turn away from him, God's not going to abandon them. I've, my dad used to say this to me all the time. He used to use this illustration as a pastor. He'd tell the congregation, you know, my son Mark could look at me and get mad. He can spit in my face. He could slap me upside the face. He could kick me in the leg. He could grab his stuff, pack it all up, get in his car, and move away from the home. But he will never stop being my son. I may be mad at him. I may be upset with him. I may not want to speak to him ever again, but he'll never stop being my son. But my dad said, I'll always love my son. I'll always love my children. No matter how much they hurt you, no matter how much they make you mad, you'll always love them. I find that to be true. I love my children. I want to kill them sometimes, but um, don't be watching. If it, I hope that, well, anyway. Um, if they're watching, now, Shannon, I'm, I'll always love you, baby. Always. Uh, she's probably watching from Texas. I'll never get mad at you, baby. You're always great. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just get mad. I mean, they do things that just irritate you. I mean, they say when they're little, they step on your feet. When they're older, they step on your heart, right? They hurt you. They, they make you mad, and you go, oh, my goodness, I just want to go. But they, you love them all the more. They're still your children. You can't stop. You never stop loving them. You care so much about them, right? And that's the way God is with us. That's the way God is with the nation of Israel. As much as they had hurt Him, as much as they had abandoned Him, as much as they had turned their backs on Him, no matter how many idols they worshipped, no matter how wicked they had become, He still loved them and would never turn His back on them. And that's good news, isn't it? It's good news to us, I know. It's good news to me, because I know that I've failed Him. I know that I've done things that are stupid. I've made bad decisions. I've done wrong things, and yet God still loves me. Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. You see, that's just God's character. He's always faithful, even when we're unfaithful. Even when we, 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 we find ourselves faithless, He is still faithful. So again, we come to the subject, and this is what I think is really interesting here. Hosea says, repent, return, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you stumbled against, stumbled because of your iniquity. I love the way Hosea does this because now he's looking at them and he goes, I'm going to speak to you like you're a child. I'm going to even give you the words you need to bring, the words you need to say, the words you need to use in your prayer. Here they are. If you're so thick in your head, you can't get it through your head, you need to return to the Lord and say this. Here are the words I want you to say. And he says this, Take words with you. Take, say to him, Take away all our iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. He's asking, he says, You guys need to repent. There's that word again, repent, right? Look at how Hosea says this. They need to repeat. These are people that had to acknowledge their sinfulness. They had idolatry, lawlessness, violence, murder, immorality, covetousness, abuse, rape, host of other sins that just went on and on and on that Hosea's already covered. And, and, and the sins had taken a foothold within Israel. So before the problem of sin could be solved, the people had to acknowledge that there was a problem. And I wonder oftentimes how many times we go and we don't even realize, or we, we just go before the Lord and we don't even acknowledge that we are sinners, that, we're, that we have a problem. We think we're good. Right? There's something we all need to do, Paul says. Paul says there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have, ga- they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Boy, what a description of humanity. Really, what a description of me. You ever stop to think about how evil 
You really are. And I'm not talking point. I'm not saying point fingers at church. I love you, church. Okay? Well, you're you're our new pastor. You're calling us evil. No, I'm not. But what I'm saying is this: I am. If if you stop and think, and I have, I've sat, as we've been going this, especially during this day and age. Okay, especially as we're as we're sitting here going through what we're seeing culturally with all the different movements, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the, the gay rights, and all the things we're seeing, okay? With all these things going on, have you ever stopped to sit there and think to yourself how evil you are inside? If you were put in a position where no one could see you, and no one would, would take notice, and you would not be caught, and you could get by with something, how evil are we? I mean, we sometimes let the anger burn within us. We get anger and bitter, and sometimes we get covetous. Sometimes we get gossipy. Sometimes we get hateful. Sometimes, men, we get lustful. I mean, we are evil creatures on the inside. We are sinners by nature. That's who we are. We're born into sin, and God says He's going to redeem us from that, but that we still have to, we have to fight that daily, don't we? Amen. Daily. That's just something we have to do. The Bible says we have to, him, Paul says he had to buffet his, day, his, body, his body daily, didn't he? He had, to, he had to constantly, those things he wanted to do, he didn't do, and the things he didn't want to do, he did. That's all of us, isn't it? Yeah. So, Paul is right here. We're all just, some down deep, we have those evil tendencies. And we need to be the kind of people that goes before the Lord with our lips and say, Lord, we are sinners. I have done wrong. I have failed you. And you know, sometimes we don't even think about what we've done wrong. Sometimes we go to the Lord. I do this sometimes. I go in my prayer life and I'll say, Lord, I know that I've done wrong, but I, I really at the moment I can't say what I've done wrong. Can you help me? Can you help me remember what are those things? And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. God's good at reminding me on some things that I've done wrong. Maybe a person I didn't witness to, right? Or a person or, or something I thought that day or or uh, getting my, my mind off track on what I should be doing. Sometimes we just, he, he likes to remind me of what I've done wrong. So we need to go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. And then in verse 2, you'll see this. The people need to ask for forgiveness. It's not just a, a, of admitting, it's, just not, it's not just a point of admitting that you've done something wrong. It's, it's saying, okay, Lord, I am done wrong. I need your forgiveness. They had to go, they had to go that extra step. Okay, did they ever realize that they were sinners? Did they ever realize that they were idolaters? Did they ever realize that they were adulterers? Did they ever realize that they were hateful and, and adulterous and all those things? Did they ever come to that conclusion? Well, if they did, then they needed to go before the Lord and repent and ask for forgiveness and say, Lord, I need, I need to, to I need your forgiveness. God is making it so that they have no excuse. He's telling them what to say. Hosea is going, here's what you say. Now, understand something, okay? Hosea lived in a time where the Holy Spirit did not come to talk to people. You and I don't know what that's like, okay? You and I live in an era where we have the comforter, we have the convictor, the Holy Spirit, who comes and convicts our hearts. He dwells among us. He lives within us, right? We know when we've done wrong. The Holy Spirit speaks to our inner soul and says, you've done wrong, you need to repent. Back then they didn't have that. They did not have the Holy Spirit speaking to them. All they had was the prophet. And the prophet would say this, Thus saith the Lord, the Assyrians are coming, you're going to be taken away in captivity. You need to repent. And to give you no excuse, here's the words you need to bring. Here's what you need to say. And they needed to hear it. And so he says, Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. And then John says, you remember John in the New Testament, he says, if we confess our sins, he is what? He's faithful and just to what? Forgive us of our sins. We have the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And he says, speak. We need to go to the Lord and confess it. Confess it. 
Uh, one of the biggest sins that we have in today's society that we don't even recognize, I think, is idolatry. You say, Brother Mark, I don't have any idols in my house. I don't make any graven images. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. They may not be made out of wood. It might be electronic. It might be made out of paper, little green stuff. It might be a wooden bat or a round soccer ball, round basketball. I've seen some families make travel ball their idol. Huh? That hurts, doesn't it? I've even seen somebody make uh, Mickey Mouse their idol. You say, well, how's that? Well, they go to me, they, they, they've made Disney more important than anything else. I mean, nothing wrong with Disney. Nothing wrong with going on vacation. But when you make that more important than anything else, when they would, when they would, give, up, when they would give up their job, when they would give up anything, they'd give up church, they'd give up vacation Bible school, they'd give up service, they'd give up anything just so they could go to Disney World, just so they could be a part of that several times a year. I mean, I understand. We all need vacations. But when your house is decorated that way, your life is decorated that way, your, your, everything you surround yourself is decorated that way, you would give up everything just so you could be a part. Some of them have decided to even move down there when they retire because that's where they want to be. They know more about the parks than they do about the Bible. They know more about the seven dwarfs than they do about the disciples. I'm serious. Have you ever met somebody like that? I know a fellow right now that can tell you everything there is to know about the parks. He can tell you what time they open, what time they close, which one's the busiest, which one's not. But if you ask him to tell you about the five doctrines, or the major, not the five doctrines, but the major doctrines of the Bible, he couldn't tell you two of them. They'll study their brains out trying to figure out other things. And they won't devote themselves to the Word of God or to the Lord. We have a tendency to make idols, don't we? And it's, it's, it's okay. We're all prone to it. We all sin. We all do. But here's the deal. When you recognize it, Hosea says, go before him. Repent. Recognize your sin. Repent of it. And turn from it. Again, there's nothing wrong with liking those things. There's nothing wrong with liking sports or liking Disney World. There's nothing wrong with loving vacations. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is when they become more important than God, there's the problem, right? I like Mickey Mouse. I like Disney. That's one of the best vacations I've ever been on. I love going to Israel. I love going to the beach. I love sports. You can't tell it. But I love it. But here's the thing. It, when you make it more important than anything else you do, if you make it more important than God, there's an issue. There's an issue. Number three, they need to turn to God for mercy. He's the only one. Verse three, salvation is found in no one else other than God. Assyria will not turn back. No matter how much money they give in tribute, the armies they have cannot save them. Their money, their wealth, their fame, their power or even their false idols they have made will not save them. Only the mercy of God will save them. That's what Hosea says. For in you the orphan finds mercy. If the orphan finds mercy in God, everyone else does too. We've already established that a person cannot be saved, right? They cannot be saved apart from faith and repentance. You can't. Repentance has to be a part of it. That's... Something I want to establish with you. Repentance has to be a part of salvation. Jesus preached repentance. And I want to just talk about this for just a second, okay? We're going to hold your place right there. We'll talk about this for just a second. Jesus preached repentance. But his message about repentance wasn't about behavior, but an inner change that brings rise to a new God centered, Christ exalting behavior. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 says, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke chapter 5 verse 32, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. 
Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus was talking, he says, Nineveh's going to rise up and condemn you guys because they repented. And, and that was the words of Jonah, just a prophet. I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah. Luke chapter 13, verse 5, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The first demand of Jesus' public ministry was repent. He spoke this command indiscriminately to all he would, who would listen. It was a call for radical inward change. And so two things show us that repentance is an internal change of mind and heart rather than mere sorrow. A lot of people think that repentance is just, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. No, there's more to it than that. We, we have to feel sorry for it, but there has to be something greater, doesn't it? It's not just a mere transformation of our, or improvement on our behavior. First, the meaning of Greek word behind the English word repent is metaneo points to this direction. It has two parts. You have meta and neo, okay? The meta is a, is, is a prefix, and it means movement or change. The second part is neo. It refers to a mind and its thoughts and perceptions and dispositions and purposes. So the basic meaning of repent is to experience a change of mind, perceptions, dispositions, and purposes. In other words, I look at something and now my mind is changing. Let's say I have a problem with gossip. I have a sinful nature of gossip. And, and I, and I want to disguise it as prayer requests. Okay? You ever had that happen to you before, ladies? I've got a prayer request. I just got to tell you about this person. <laughs> Let me just say, she needs a lot of prayer. And then for the next 20 minutes, they begin to gossip about the person that needs prayer. Listen, gossip can, can happen to anybody. It happens to men, too. We talk about people. We're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of talking about people. We gossip. And so we have a sinful nature of wanting to talk about things, okay? Gossip. So when I come to God to repent, I can't just come to God and say, God, I'm sorry for my, for my gossip. I'm sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have gossiped. And then the next day, go back out and gossip again. That's, that's, not, that's not it. Or maybe I don't gossip for the next week. What there needs to be is a behavioral change, a mind, a concept. I have to look at gossip differently now. When I come to God and repent, I say, uh-oh, it's not just that I'm doing wrong because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up again. What I need to do is start seeing gossip as sin and breaking God's law, and I need to have a different view of it, a different purpose of it, a different lifestyle. My repentance now has got to change my heart. You see? There's a difference there. It doesn't mean you're not going to mess up. It doesn't mean you're not going to make a mistake. What it means is that you've got to have a different attitude about it. You've got to start thinking, oh, there's something. I, I need to really work on this. I really need God to convict me more often of this. It's got to be a heart change. The second factor that points to the meaning of repent is the way Luke chapter 3, verse 8 describes the relationship between repentance and new behavior. It says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Then it gives examples of the fruits. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Luke chapter 3 verse 11 is where it says that. So this means that repenting is what happens inside of us that leads to the fruits of a new behavior. Repentance is not new deeds, but an inward change that bears fruit of new deeds. Jesus is demanding that we experience an inward change. When I go to the Lord and I repent of my gossip, then I have to start making an inward change. There's something that God has got to do within me and I've got to recognize it. And when I come and I get and I go to grab that phone and I call and I say, you know what, I want to, I want to pray. You know what, we need to pray for her, but I'm not going to go into any details. Let's just pray for her. There has to be a different difference in change different heart change. you got to see things differently. Okay? Let's move on. Going back to Hosea. We had the last appeal in verses 1 through 3. 
I want to look at the last promise. The last promise. There's five blessings. Look at verse 4. Hosea chapter 14, verse 4. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily. He will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His shoots will sprout. His beauty will be like the olive tree and His fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. Those who live in His shadow will again arise, raise grain, and they will blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like a luxuriant cypress. From me comes your fruit. Now, you say, did that ever happen? It hasn't happened yet. So is Hosea wrong? No. Here's what Hosea is doing. Hosea said, you know, you're going you're gonna to one day become a nation again. One day, as a lot of prophets said, they gave a prophecy, they could see the end, but they didn't always see the, the trees in, in between. They could, it's like looking over a mountain and seeing the mountain off in the distance, but not seeing all the ravines and all the valleys in between. Prophets could see the end. They saw, and they would tell exactly what God said to say, and He would say this, and so they prophesied. One day, Israel's going to become a great nation again. One day, all the people are going to look at them again. One day, they're, they're going to be famous. One day, they're going to be the fragrance of the world. One day, everybody's going to surround them. And, well, when's that going to happen? When's it going to happen? You know, when's it going to happen? I'm asking y'all, when's it going to happen? Well, when the Lord uh, destroys everything and starts... And starts, exactly, right. When God brings it in, right? When God brings, makes a great nation. Second coming of Christ, right? God is going to raise up the nation of Israel. They're going to be the center of the world. Where's He going to set His foot? Where's... He's going to set it down in, in, on, on, in, in Jerusalem, right? So God's going to make a great nation out of them again, right? And all the worlds will come back. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of problems in between now and then, but God's going to bring it. And then look at all the things He's going to do. I love what He says He's going to do. God will heal them of their wicked behavior and shower His love upon them. He will give them new life to the person who truly repents. He'll satisfy their thirst for life. God will make a nation strong like the cedar tree of Lebanon. The Lord will give deep roots to His people. In other words, He's going to cause them to grow deeply, deeply in His Word. They're going to love Him. They're going to grow deeply. They're going to become mature people in His Word, grow in faith as a mighty nation of people. And look how He describes their blessings. Beautiful like the splendor of an olive tree. Acceptable to all, producing a fragrance of a cedar tree. Secure, dwelling in the shade of the protection of God's, God Himself. Fruitful, blossoming like a flourishing vine with the fruit of God's Spirit. And famous like the wine of Lebanon. He is going to make them such a great nation. Why? Because He will reign as the King. He'll come back. Those are His people. He will erase all idolatrous worship. They will no longer put their trust in false gods. He will answer their prayer and meet all their needs. He, will, needs. he will be like a green tree that always bears fruit and provides for His people. Well, we know that hadn't happened yet. They still don't know Him as God yet. They, you go to Israel with me sometime, you'll find out they still don't believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Some do. Most of them do not. They're still looking for the Messiah. I had a guy that knew the Bible right backwards, upwards and downwards and sideways. He knew everything about it, but still didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. It's, it's astounding to me. But one day they will. One day they will grow deep. One day they will have great faith. One day they will worship, right? All right. So we have the last appeal. We have the last promise. I also want you to see the last word. And this will get you right here. Hosea chapter 14, verse 9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but the transgressors will stumble in them. Whoever is wise will learn and walk in these ways. Um, I hope my children don't watch this. <laughs> Shannon, I'm sorry. Turn your, turn your computer off, Shannon. Um. When I, when I was growing up, I thought I knew everything. 
And I know it's, it's a common plague of teenagers. I'm sorry, guys. I know it's a common plague of teenagers to think you've got the world by the tail. You know everything there is to know about everything. You know exactly what you're doing when you get a job. You know exactly what you're doing when you buy a house. You know exactly what you're doing when you're doing this and doing that, right? I talk, I, I've done this before. I've talked to my kids before, and I said, look, if I could go back in time, there's some things I'd change. There's some things I'd do differently. How many of you would do that? Okay, just about every adult in this room has raised their hand. If you could go back in time, you would do things differently. If you could go back in time and listen to your parents, would you do it? How many would do that? Amen. Did your parents have some wisdom? Amen. Yeah. When I was growing up, I thought like most teenagers, parents don't have a clue what they're talking about because they don't live in the era that I'm living in. They don't understand what teenagers are going through. I mean, they don't understand what it is to write a letter. They don't understand what it means to, to dial on the phone and have to miss your girlfriend because you can't stay on there for long distance. Now we have teenagers that don't know how to dial a phone. You give them a rotary phone, they wouldn't know what to do with it. What's a rotary, what's a rotary phone? What's a letter? You know? We, we, they have, we have emails, texting, FaceTime, all that stuff. And I, I look at it and go, man, if I had a girlfriend that lived in California and I had FaceTime, we'd have been, a lot, we'd been together a lot longer than I did when we weren't writing letters because you know, writing letters just got old real quick. You'd break up with a long-distance relationship and never worked. And then they, now they got dating apps. You can find somebody on, on Love Tingle. I don't know what it is. I'm just making up names now. You, just, you can. I'm just making up names now. But you can find you find all these all these apps, all these different websites. You can find love. They'll love match all these match these matches. Oh, match perfect man. They, they'll match you up. You answer all the questions just right. They'll match you with the perfect mate. Man, in my day, it was like, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? I I remember when I was in a quartet, I went and sang in front of a group one time, and I said. Uh, after the song, after the group was over, there was this beautiful girl, and I walked up to her and I said, "Man, you you remind me of my first wife." She said, "Well, how many times have you been married?" I said, "I've never been married." <laughs> that was a good pickup line, wasn't it? <laughs> but I was like, I was, I was just, I mean, I was love strict. I'm, but but today things have changed, and so teenagers today go, "You don't understand what I'm going through." You don't understand how to handle all that. We got, we got bullying on the Internet. You didn't have that problem. No, I didn't have any problem with bullying. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I did. We just got it face to face. We didn't do it over the Internet. We got shoved up against the lockers. Uh, did you? Yeah, we had bullying in high school. Well, you didn't have problems with drugs. Yeah, we did. Well, you went to a Christian school, Dad. You didn't have any problem with, with kids having sex. Yeah, we did. We had the same issues. We had the same problems. And if I could go back and learn from my parents and listen to what they said and said, Mark, you'll do this, you'll stay out of trouble. If you'll do that, you'll cause yourself to have a whole lot of happier life and, and, and miss some pitfalls that I made. And now when I, as a parent, I try to say, kids, if you'll just do some things I'm trying to tell you, you'll keep yourself from having some heartache. And no. You, 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 you don't understand, don't you? Every parent in this room is going, yeah. It's hard raising kids. It really is. But Hosea says, if you'll listen to my words... Those, that I've, those words that I've given you from the Lord God Himself, if you'll listen to these words, you'll be able to walk rightly. You'll be able to not stumble and not fall. You'll live in blessing and not, and not stumble into unrighteousness and, and hurt yourself. You will save yourself a lot of heartache if you'll just listen to my words. And, and oftentimes I think we, the pastors have the same issue on Sunday mornings that we have every other time. We preach the Word of God. We're preaching the Word of God. We're preaching the Word of God. And we say, if you'll just listen to what God has to say, yeah. things will change. But so many times we let the same thing happen that they did. It just goes, 
in one ear and out the other or goes right overhead. We're thinking about tomorrow's work day or we're thinking about the car we want to buy or we're thinking about the house problems or we're thinking about children and their issues. And, we're, and we come to church not prepared to hear God's word. We come, we come to meetings like this and we've had a rough day and I understand that. You're tired. And then we get you hyped up on sugar. I'm not complaining about that at all. I understand. But the Word of God is there for us to grow by. And Hosea says, if you'll listen, you'll see that the ways of the Lord are right. If you'll just listen, the righteous walk in them and experience the blessings and obedience. But if you refuse to listen, here's what's going to happen. If you're rebellious, you're going to stumble. You're going to fall into destruction. And it's going to be a direct result of disobedience because you wouldn't listen. The broken commandments become the ultimate reason for their downfall. Tom, Thomas Edward McKimsky said this about, he, he was writing about the closing of Hosea. He was kind of writing a summation he said this, Hosea's marriage was bittersweet, but so was Yahweh's relationship with His people. They stumbled in the way and fell. They rationalized their false religion and defended their national policies as necessary to their survival. All the while, they moved closer to extinction. The key to survival and eventual exaltation as a people was simple, yet profound. They had only to acknowledge their wrongdoing. If their hearts were broken, their relationship to God would be mended. If you go back to the very beginning of Hosea, God tells Hosea to marry a woman of harlotry. It was a beautiful picture of the way Israel was treating God. She was adulterous. She was running out on Him. If she had only quit... If she had only listened to Hosea when he said, come home, come home. If you'll just stop living this life and come home, I'll love you. I'll take care of you. I'll nurture you. You won't have to worry. We'll have children. We'll have a home. We'll be able to have a great ministry together. Just come home. And she wouldn't listen. And she kept stumbling and kept stumbling and kept stumbling. And to the point of that she finally got sold into slavery. It took her falling to the depths of despair and brokenness for her to wake up. So, in light of all that, in light of all the destruction that came their way, and God brought judgment upon the nation of Israel, we know it. Hosea's prophecies came true. Assyria came down, wiped them out. I proved that to you last week. I showed it to you. In gory detail, the judgment of God fell. If they had just listened, if they had just repented, oh, what God would have done for them. So I want to close by asking you some questions. Number one, if you and I are the bride of Christ, are we being faithful to Him and Him alone? Are we? Is there anything in our life that is more important than God? Has that one thing become an idol in your life? Are you and I willing to repent, to forsake all and return to Him, and add to that, stay faithful to Him? Not just return, but stay faithful. Whoever's wise, let him understand these things. Whosoever's discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The ways of the Lord are right. And the righteous will walk in them, but the transgressors will stumble in them. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter, and I'm going to close with this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, he says, In coming to him as to living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. 
you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for the holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who don't believe or disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and offense. For the believer... For those of us who believe in Christ and we remain faithful, He is the chief cornerstone. But for the disbeliever, for those that don't want to obey, that don't believe in God, it's going to become a stumbling block, a stumbling stone. Peter understood this. Paul understood it. He he quoted it too. So again, I ask you, are you and I willing to repent, forsake all, return to Him, and stay faithful to Him? That's the question. Will you bow your heads? Father, I want to thank You for this time tonight. I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for Hosea and and the powerful message that he, He gives every chapter. Lord, I understand the, the, His life story. I understand His testimony. I understand His that it was a, a perfect vision of how Israel was treating You and and I understand the anger, Lord. I understand the bitterness and the, and the hatred and, 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 and the anger that you, that you well, not necessarily ha- hatred, but the anger that you brought against them because of how they were treating you. And Father, I understand that we deserve to be, Lord, I deserve. I deserve to have that burning anger against me. How many times have I run out on you? How many times have I failed you? How many times have I worshipped other things? and put other things more important than you. And Father, that can't be. It can't be. I've got to live a life, Father, that is pleasing to you. I've got to live a life that follows your commands. I want to be, I want to be blessed. I don't want to stumble. And Father, I just pray that we're not too late. I pray for our country, for our nation. I pray for our families, those that are not here, that we are praying for those that, Lord, I know so many cards are coming in for family members of, that need to be back in church. And it's not just church, Father. They need to be back in a relationship with you. So, Father, I lift them up to you, and I pray that it's not too late. I pray that we will, as a nation, repent, that we as churches, as Christians, will come back to you, that we'll love you and you only. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Any comments or questions? Yes, sir.